This paper is entitled uh, Utah, uh, Urban Archaeology in the City of the Saints and the Growth of a Real Frontier City. Before I begin, I want to tell you why I chose Frontier City. There are really basically two frontier models that we see in the Western United States. The first is the one that we're all familiar with, literature and movies. The Western town, the boom towns, the cattle towns, these are temporary towns for the most part because the commercial people who move into these uh, towns didn't want to put a lot of investment into their money or into their businesses in, in the, knowing that they could collapse or have to pick up and move. J.C. Penney is one of these examples where he failed three times. Frank L. Baum, who wrote The Wizard of Oz, failed three times in Western communities with these types of businesses. So the, the, the infrastructure in these towns are very small. We see them as ghost towns now. They're mostly foundations, some rock walls, some buildings that were a little bit more substantial, such as banks and things like this. The second model is the one that I want to use here, which is in downtown Salt Lake. Salt Lake City was established by Mormon pioneers that are the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They came to stay. They were avoiding persecution, and so their model is a little bit more substantiated, and it's their infrastructure that I want to talk about because we see much more permanency and advancement in their technology than we see in other uh, cities of the of, uh, time period. Uh, this project uh, comes out of uh, mostly the uh, activities in, uh, done over the last 30 years in and around Utah. This includes Nevada, uh, Idaho, Arizona, and some other projects, other states. Also, it's in this uh, project, the federal courthouse, uh, the new federal courthouse in Salt Lake City, as you saw in the previous slide, was a 10-story building. It was done in three phases. Uh, you can see its relationship to downtown Salt Lake. This is a 1946 aerial photograph of the block. We're talking only the southern half of it at the moment. This is the project. Uh, the in blue and the yellow, as well as the red. The first phase was picking up the independent Order of Rodfellows building there, turning it 180 degrees and moving it across the street into that blue, blue area, which is the new location. Then excavating everything in the lower blue and the yellow in which to build this 10-story structure. This was the Odd, uh, Odd Fellows buildings that had to be picked up and moved. So we did ex ended up doing excavations around it and, uh, and under it. Okay, the archaeology uh, ended up uh, discovering 30 historic buildings and features. And it's these features along with uh, some of the past information that we, we get. Here, this is Salt Lake City. You can see where it says the courthouse, it's almost in the heart of downtown Salt Lake. It's only three blocks south. This is, one, this is from the earliest map of the block, Block 51. As you see, it's been divided up into residential. And it was for a long period of time. Salt Lake City, uh, being a Mormon community, you can see that they put into an effort into building substantial buildings, not wood frame buildings. This comes from several reasons. Brigham Young, their leader, decided that wood was not the medium to build in, even though he was a carpenter and loved wood, for the simple reason they lived in a desert and it presented a fire hazard. So he encouraged all of his followers to build in brick, adobe brick, or stone, and, use, and save wood only for signs, roofing, or window frames, things like that, rather than using them on the structures. And as you can see here, all of these buildings are either brick or stone, adobe brick. This is a view of Salt Lake City in 1875. As you can see, it's growing quite uh, uh, big, but it is mostly an agricultural community with the farms on the outside and the fields on the outside. Contrary to what I just said, the first buildings were built in the shape of a fort using log construction. But rapidly, as you can see in the photograph from the 1860s, they've already gone to adobe brick, and you see no log cabins except the ones that were preserved. 
Here, Salt Lake City, uh, circa 1890, and you can see that, again, they've gone to bridge con uh, brick construction over Adobe. Uh, this is the assembly hall on Temple Square in the upper left, and Brigham, one of Brigham Young's two houses, the Lion House on the, on the right side, I'm sorry, the Beehive House on the right side. One of the very first uh, structures they undertook in 1850, only three years after settling the Salt Lake Valley, was the Tabernacle, which still stands today. You see the arch standing on piers. Now these arches are held in place by only two things, and that are is wood pegs and leather strapping. There are no nails, no spikes, or any metal screws, bolts, or anything holding that structure up. But they're putting the effort into building such a large structure in 1850 because of the permanence of the community. They were not planning on moving. So they're using the most advanced uh, building techniques that they know of to make a freestanding arch dome building. There are no supports on the inside except to hold the balcony in which people seat, uh, are seated in. In 1905, the state of Utah sold uh, the northeast corner of uh, the south half of the block to the United States government for one dollar in which to create a post office. You see the post office uh, and uh, courthouse, federal courthouse here in 1932 and a modern picture of it today. In 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 1935. In 1932 the building was enlarged which took off the entire east half, southern uh, and east half of the, of the block. Another innovation that the that they attempted to do. In 1852, between 1847 and 1852, they built a mill at Liberty Park. This is called the Isaac Chase Mill. It still stands, it's still part of it. There's a, it's been cleaned up. It's a freestanding brick building. But what's unique about it is, because of the lowness of where the building sits out on a flat area, it was problematic on how to power this mill using water with a water wheel. So they overcame this by the uh, architect and the builder uh, going, uh, sending for a book on turbines. And in the 1970s, uh, a team of archaeologists from BYU excavated in the basement. And when, actually as part of the team, when we cleaned out, we finally got the last of the mud out of those boxes, the wheels began to turn. So they were using turbines to power this mill, actually two of them, instead of a water wheel. So they're using the most up-to-date uh, technology that they're aware of to build the infrastructure of Salt Lake. And the uh, courthouse block, this, is the, this wall here is the boundary line between most of the properties, the back boundary line, where we expected to find most of the trash and privy vaults. Unfortunately, we did not find any. What we did find, uh, of course, were the uh, two remains of 1848 uh, and 50 buildings. What's unique about these buildings, and they don't show very well in these photographs at the moment, is this one belonged to F.C. Andrews, who was a blacksmith. He had a blacksmith shop out in front, and he made quite a, a good business at blacksmithing. Uh, his house was really up to date as far as uh, plumbing. This is one of the ones that were connected to what we call cesspits. No privy vaults were found on the block, which kind of surprised us because we had anticipated this. We figured that this was going to be the technology we found. We found no evidence of privies in 18, from 1847 up to the 1850s. What we found were these cesspits with ceramic piping, as you can see, going into the pits. This one was about, that one was about uh, four to five feet in diameter. The other uh, two of them out of the six were 10 feet to 12 feet in diameter. You can see they're made from dry wall. They were de uh, 10 to 12 feet deep and allowed for a lot of sewage to run into them. These dots on the map represent the location of these sewer pits, cesspits. The two red ones are the two large ones, uh, 10 feet in diameter. The blue one is a six foot uh, to seven foot one found behind the Oddfellows building. 
and then the three yellow ones were smaller ones, five feet in diameter and about eight to ten feet deep. Each one of these buildings, we found the pipes running to them. Now we know that the ceramic pipes probably didn't arrive until the time of the railroad. But we do have evidence, including an excavation out in the street, that wood pipes were still being used. We have wood pipes from Fort Douglas. We also have wood pipes in, being used for carrying culinary water as well as, as, as sewage. In 1892, um, the uh, water system, or sewer system, came up the uh, West Street here, which is Main Street on the west side, I'm sorry, on the east side, the right side of the photo, and across uh, Market Street here. The first sewer connect in Salt Lake City happened at a building right there where the post office sits. Thus, from this and some and many of the others, and we don't have time here because we only got 15 minutes, is that um, uh, because of the permanence of this frontier town, the pioneers were putting large efforts into the infrastructure, not just privies, but sewer systems, water systems. Uh, water was being carried in an early manner, not just down the streets, but culinary under the ground. We have uh, water, uh, instead of water wheels, we have turbines. We have all kinds of examples of advanced technology, at least for a pioneer frontier town out in the middle of the Great Basin, which is quite isolated until 1869 and coming the railroad, using these this infrastructure uh, for a more permanent and more beautiful city, essentially, and showing that the pioneers wanted a more permanent city than, it, uh, than you would see on a regular frontier town. So the infrastructure becomes important for us to understand how the society is viewing their permanence and their position in uh, the West. Thank you.